I, I want to thank you all so much for um, making me feel like I'm in my comfort zone and for uh, choosing to address the issue of immigration in the country today. There are so many topics um, to choose from and uh, you and, and Reverend Andrew chose this one because you've recognized as a congregation that we're living in a double standard right now. Um, one of the many things we offer, and I'll of course, um, I'm already communicating with the uh, Reverend Andrew and then members of your congregation who are putting together an art build in anticipation of um, the May 1st March this year. Um, and I'll share other ways you can get involved. Uh, one of the ways that I'm involved and what I coordinate are court accompaniments for people who um, cannot drive, or I'm not going to say cannot drive, but they can drive. And actually, up until 11 years ago today, they could drive. They had licenses. And April 1st, 2007, the um, right to drive or the right to have a functioning updated license was basically taken away from people who could not produce a social security card. So, um, you know, uh, know that, that it, this was not forever. Um, there were, uh, there was a swath of, of people in our state who were driving to and from work and able to pick up their kids from school and able to just go on a day trip and you know, able to do all the things that we, we do in our vehicles because we're in a place where public transportation isn't the best. And um, that was taken away. So now when somebody's been uh, charged with driving without a license, which happens quite a bit, um, we as New Sanctuary accompany uh, that person to their court hearing. And I'm just going to tell a, a short story about a woman who I actually cannot, I, I can't stop thinking about her. Her name is Oralia. And uh, I accompanied her last week to Waukesha. Uh, she had been stopped two times for driving without a license. Once, her car had broken down on the side of the road. Um, that, was, that was the uh, crime, um, and uh, that was the reason that a police officer pulled over. And I don't know about you, but my car has broken down on the side of the road, and I have never been asked for my license. I've never been asked for my papers, you know, maybe my license, maybe. But I'm, I was trying to kind of, in, in my head, when she told me this, sort through, well, okay, do they ever ask for, no, I really don't think so. I think that in the past when I've had troubles with my vehicle, when I've had, the police have stopped and uh, they've asked, how can we help? And in the case of this woman, Oralia, the police stopped and said, show me your identification. And she was uh, charged once for driving without a license. Um, the second time, uh, same kind of thing. It was just really weird. You know, she had this charge, but yet, what was she actually doing? Was she driving over the speed limit? All the little reasons that we get stopped. And it, it really became apparent that um, she was stopped for being Mexican. I mean, it, it really did seem like it, she was stopped for, um, she even said to me that when um, the family had visited Monterrey, where she's from in Mexico, one of her sons, her 14-year-old son, um, who actually is a citizen of the United States, she's the mother of two DACA recipients and a citizen. And he had said to her like, mom, let's get these cool bumper stickers that say that we're from Monterrey, you know, and that have the Mexican flag on it. And, you know, he was proud. He's proud of where he's from, proud of his heritage. And she said to me, I just feel like it was those bumper stickers. Like, I, and I wanted to take the bumper stickers off of the car, but I couldn't because my 14-year-old son was excited about where he's from and he wanted to have the bumper stickers. And then she was just like, why should I take the bumper stickers from my home off of my car? <laughs> so... She's, this is really her words verbatim, and, and this is a lot of times what we do as court accompanists, uh, which I hope that you um, s uh, uh, contact me about. It's actually quite interesting and important work, is we sit next to people as they, on their way to and from court, sort of filter through. Basically, the question is, what am I doing here? Why am I here? Why is so much of my life now taken up going to court and back? Why do I have to hire a lawyer to the tune of $850? You know, because public defenders in this country, um, one, do not represent somebody once their case has moved into the realm of immigration, and two, don't really know a whole lot about a very, very rapidly changing um, immigration law system. So we get there and it's my job to sit next to her and very softly translate. And the first thing that the judge in the court says is, 
You're here today, and she's looking at everybody there, because you are being charged with a criminal offense. Make no mistake about it. You might think that it's a traffic offense, but this is criminal court. So I have to look at Orali and say, está diciendo que usted está aquí porque usted está siendo cargando como un criminal. And um, I'm crying a little bit now, and I just began, at that moment, I began to just be, I was embarrassed. I was, I, talk about mortification. I mean, talk about the mortification of this woman who is, you know, uh, she's, she's a mother. She is a member of her church congregation. She's a woman who's been in this country for 23 years. She has raised three children. And basically that's, that's what I, that's what I have to translate to her. That's what's being said. So at that point I looked over and on her lap was um, the, um, the invoice from her attorney. Um, you know, a very good attorney, but an attorney who she's paying $850 to show up in Waukesha and meet her that day. This is not something that she's paying once. This is something that she's paying, you know, it, it's, it, it's a lot. So I start feeling just, I start feeling basically what she's been asking me the entire, what, what are we doing here? What are we, why, I'm, I'm sitting next to this person who's being, char who's being charged a ton of money, basically to defend her right at this point to be here. Because Orale has been charged two times for driving without a license. And she knows and I know that this is a criminal offense. She knows and I know that right now, in Waukesha especially, the police are sharing um, people's records with immigration. So once people is, are, when somebody's being charged with a criminal offense, they are on the radar. And uh, so Oralia gets called up, the you know, lawyer is defending her, someone is translating in her ear. I, I'm sitting behind her and I can see her visibly shaking. And uh, it, it's over, she's charged two times, the judge tells a 55-year-old woman who's been here for 23 years and who has a driver's license that she is absolutely under no circumstances to drive anywhere. And she accepts this, and then the judge says, we're gonna send you over to the sheriff's office to be fingerprinted. And it's just, um, I, I feel like I should be, there, there, is, there is a resurrection part of the story, I promise, but it, it, the long and the short of it is, um, the steps that Oralia had to take for doing what she was told was right. Going to court, you get a notice to go to court, you go to court. The steps that day were basically summarily took her from the position of being a mother, being um, an independent mother who can drive her 14 year old son to school, an independent mother who, you know, she was saying to me in the car, like, my husband and I, we like to do stuff. <laughs> This is a beautiful state. We like to drive to Horicon Marsh and go for a hike. You know, we like to, we like to take road trips. We can't. And increasingly what's happening to their family is they're spending a lot more time at home. So she gets fingerprinted. She comes out. By the time she comes out from being fingerprinted, we are both just living in a different, we're both on a different plane of um, kind of ludicrosity. What's going on is, is ludicrous. And we get in the car, and she just sits quietly for a little while, and she says, Yo no soy un criminal. Yo no soy un criminal. Yo, yo vine aquí hace 23 años para hacer una buena vida por mis hijos. She starts basically in Spanish telling me why she came to this country, justifying for me, for herself, for God, <laughs> why why she's here. I am not a criminal. I am not a criminal. I am not a criminal. I saw her a couple, a couple of days later. She had received in the court, basically, just in case she had forgotten, a reminder that, hey, you're a criminal. This is your next date. So uh, the question that I start asking, and, and the question that you're obviously already asking yourselves, and um, we are so incredibly grateful for it, is what, what makes somebody a criminal? And that's why I think just the connection with um, Easter, the story of Easter and Holy Week and the resurrection. What made Jesus a criminal? What makes any of us criminal? And then what is scary for me and what I see is at what point, how many times is somebody called a criminal and labeled a criminal before they start to feel like a criminal? And that is what we 
push against at New Sanctuary Movement, and that is what we push against at Bolsas de la Frontera, and that is what congregations like you push against, is we are the people who look people in the eyes and can be in that uncomfortable place with people and say, hey, you know what? You are not a criminal. You matter. You are a mother. You are a teacher. You are a community member. You are a child of God. You are many things, but you are not a criminal, and I am here to walk with you. Um, and uh, that is essentially what we do. And we hope that you will all walk with us in Waukesha on May 1st, after you have your beautiful banners and all the, all the things that you're going to make on April 29th after the service here for uh, a, an art build. Um, and we hope that you will march with us against 287G, the program in Waukesha that uh, basically currently now they're training for sheriffs to act as immigration and customs officials, basically takes out the medium between the police and immigration. So essentially there's no ice hold per se, there's no communication, a police officer can conceivably pull somebody over and then start deportation proceedings for that person. So, and, and we're not talking, we're talking about ora, Oralia, we're talking about mothers and teachers and community members. Um, we hope that you march with the dreamers because we are still pushing in spite of the roller coaster of promises. We're still pushing for um, a clean dream act that will offer a pathway to citizenship for young people who are already in the midst of receiving their education and their parents. Um, and we hope that you will push for um, sustained changes in the way that we welcome people in our community as people who can drive, as people who can, basically people who have a right to live their lives in the way that you and I live every day. Um, and uh, I invite you all to, I'll share all of my information, some of you already have my information. Um, come with us, come to us with your, with your questions and uh, come with us with your hearts and um, come with us with your discomfort and come with us with your pain about what is happening. Um, one thing is for sure, when we are walking together, even though we're walking perhaps into dangerous territory and uncomfortable territory, we can turn to the person beside us and we can look into their eyes and we can um, share a moment as children of God um, and basically remember that we are in this together. Thank you so very much. Uh, on behalf of New Sanctuary, on behalf of Voices, we're so terribly grateful, and um, I wish you all a joyful, joyful day.